Good evening, and thank you. Can I be heard? Thank you, uh, thank you, Rick and Doris, for those introductions. You probably have not heard of the man I'm going to quote now, but you should. His name is Gulaban Hekmetar. How many people have heard of him? Yeah, very few of you. He came out with a statement just this week, and I want to give you this uh, word for word. He said, in Afghanistan, where he leads the Islamist uh, fighters who are making a comeback, the solution is to have a new government. And it must include all sides in the country, which means his people, too. And in addition to that, by the by, quote, the defeat of the United States is near, end quote. Now, if we were uh, here in 2001, you would have every right to laugh me off the stage. Who is this guy? Nobody's heard of him. He's claiming that his people ought to be running Afghanistan, and that the defeat of the world's most powerful nation, not just today, but in the history of mankind, that the, our defeat is imminent. And yet, when you look at the facts, it looks as if he's right. He wants two things, right? He wants the, uh, his people in the government. Well, that is what they have. The, the Taliban and their Islamist allies who, who seek a totalitarian vision of Islam as the political ideal are in control of large parts of Afghanistan, and they're encroaching on Pakistan. They don't just have uh, random checkpoints. They have a shadow government, which means they have established courts. You have a divorce you want to take care of, you go to them. You want to have your land dispute sorted, you go to them. They are running, in effect, their own state within Afghanistan. To give you a flavor of how powerful they have become, they're enforcing their law, their Islamist law, in these parts, by force. In uh, 2001 and 2006, that five-year period, there were a total of uh, 30 suicide bombings over five years. Which you, if you, I mean, they're terrible. There shouldn't be a single one. But if you average it out, what's that? Uh, Six a year, right? In the first six months of last year, there were 1,200. The number of Americans who have died in the first 11 months, or just, I guess, up until today of this year, is 298, which is nearly double the worst year ever, which was last year. And if you look at the graph of the number of casualties, it, it is like a, a hockey stick. It just keeps climbing up like that. And, uh, you know, what we expect from the Islamists in Afghanistan is they take over and they enforce their, you know, familiar rules. Women are not allowed out. Uh, they must be covered up. You know, the whole panoply of these uh, medieval and barbaric customs. But I think what's most symbolic of what's happened uh, in Afghanistan in the last few years is the return of the so-called morality police. If you remember, during the Taliban's first uh, spell in power, they used to have these guys running around in pickup trucks. And they'd jump out of the pickup truck and they'd see someone who was not being Islamic enough or who was behaving in a way that they disapproved of. And that person would be flogged or they would be dragged to prison or they would have a wall toppled on top of them or they would be hung up in the, from the nearest lamppost, where they had lampposts. This is what Afghanistan is turning into. Women are voluntarily reapplying the veil in self-protection. I mean, this is how bad it's gotten. And you may have heard in the news that the Taliban are, are fighting their way back and that this is a huge problem. They've gotten as close as bombing the capital city, Kabul. So if you hear news reports, they, they usually show you a map of Afghanistan, and they, you know, the south is a lot of trouble, and the border areas of Afghanistan is a lot of trouble. They're at the capital, and they've got a chokehold on the main artery uh, between the two major uh, cities, Kabul and Kandahar. Now, I tell you all this, not because I know this is the Afghan Appreciation Society or the Afghan Expatriates Group. No, I mean, our main concern here is because 
Afghanistan was a launching pad for 9-11. And everything that we have in terms of open information about uh, the threat emanating from that part of the world is that it's becoming the same thing over again. Just listen to the uh, former head of the CIA in a speech last year. He said that every single plot that his organization is tracking finds its way back to the Afghan uh, Pakistan border area where the Taliban have a stronghold. And if you look at recent plots, like the one in London in 2005, this is way before the Taliban were as powerful as they are today. And then subsequent plots. These guys train there, they get all kinds of uh, funding and propaganda. This is the new epicenter for the jihad, the Islamist war of conquest. I've told you what one of these Islamist leaders believes is in the offing. He believes that his group is going to win and that the Americans are going to lose. What has been the response from our people? Well, Hillary Clinton would like us to sort between the big T Taliban and the little T Taliban. There are good guys among them. And we just have to figure out a way to peel them apart. And the ones who are good and, and really want to be peaceful and to put down their arms, well, you know, we can win them over. So essentially, they're just potential friends that we just have to work a lot harder to win over. Well, you might say she's a, she's a kook, right? you know, Secretary of State, what does she know? But, you know, just listen to one of the mainstream commentators who, as far as I know, is a re has a reputation for being non-ideological, uh, non non-anything. He's very vanilla flavored. He writes for Newsweek, if you can uh, infer from that. His name is Fareed Zakaria. Yeah. He's a big deal, right? I mean, you probably know he puts out these big, best-selling books. His recent st uh, statement on this situation. In his view, it's inevitable that what we have to do is just, and these are his words, we have to buy, rent, or borrow the loyalty of the Afghan Taliban. Take your pick. Buy it, which means you get a lasting relationship. Rent it means for as long as you keep paying. Borrow means you get some kind of leverage on them. Talk about long-range thinking. That's definitely a solution, huh? I mean, that's what we want to do, right? Pay off these people. And this is creative thinking. This is apart from the people who tell you that there's no hope, right? So they, they, these are the people with solutions. And of course, I just want to return to our administration, because after all, they have the last say on what we do. And what is Obama's position? Well, you know, we have to wait until tomorrow to find out the specific plan he has in store, but you know, given previous statements, I think we can fairly uh, safely say that what we're going to have presented to us is not a plan for victory, but a plan for something that is face-saving and that will at least put the problem away for as long as it takes to get re-elected. Something rather short-term, and ultimately, I argue, and this is one of the things that we say in the book, self-destructive. Where do I get all this? Well, read the newspaper. But the other thing he said speaks directly to this. He was asked just a few months ago, what's your view of what we can accomplish in Afghanistan? And he said this. I'm always worried about using the word victory. And, and the quote has the scare quotes. I'm not just adding that. I'm always worried about using the word victory. Because, you know, it invokes this notion of Emperor Hirohito in, in World War II coming down and signing a surrender to MacArthur, end quote. So, for all of those who are benighted enough to expect that the commander-in-chief would set out as a goal the defeat of our enemy, for those people, he has this message, do not expect victory in any shape or form. Which, which I would think is a heartening message to the people we're supposed to be fighting. Now, I, I've used a lot of my time to talk about Afghanistan, and, and there's a lot more to say, but I want to touch on one other area where there's a lot of grief coming our way, and that is Iran. I'll just leave you with one uh, headline, which you probably caught over the weekend. 
after months of hand-wringing and agonizing attempts to reach out our hand to Iran. Because as you know, Obama has said that if Iran just agrees to unclench its fist, we will offer it our hand in friendship. Now, if you can, if you can stomach that kind of metaphorical uh, talk, which I think underplays the reality of how bad Iran really is, I hope you'll ask me about that. What has that bought us in the last 11 months? Well, there was a deal that cut that, what, in October, right? They all met and they had a deal. Finally, we got Iran to the table. This was progress. Uh, no, sorry. We're not interested, We're not interested in that deal. You know what? We're gonna, we have a different plan. Instead of agreeing to this cockamamie idea where we get the Iranians get nuclear fuel, they send it over to Russia and, and in other countries, and they bring it back. And it's you know foreign policy as it, as constructed by Ruth Goldberg. Instead of that, we, you know we're not we're not interested in your your hand in friendship. We're gonna we're gonna open ten new nuclear facilities, which would give us the capacity for something like 500,000 centrifuges, which means the equivalent of 160 nuclear bombs worth of fuel, not in 10 years, per year, in a single year. Now, you know, who knows how long it might take them to build that many centrifuges if they ever do, but this is their attitude. Their attitude is, you can come groveling on your knees as much as you want, we're gonna keep spitting in your face and slapping you down. And we're going to keep killing your people, because that's our goal. You know, when we sing, the Iranians uh, tell their uh, Friday sermon followers, death to America, they mean it. Now, I hope I've thoroughly depressed you. Because I, I want to just turn to the final point in my uh, presentation, and that is to raise a question that uh, I will touch on and my colleague will uh, expand on, and then you can explore in the Q&A. And that is, how on earth did we get to this point? You know, the United States is, by every measure, economic, military, technological, the, nobody yet outpaces us. And yet we're, we've got this situation in Afghanistan that practically everyone in our culture believes is a lost cause, and in which the enemy believes it is winning. We've got the world's most active state sponsor of Islamic terrorism, Iran, according to the State Department, not just in the last five years, not just in Iraq, not just in the Palestinian terrors, but for the last 30 years. This regime is not only in business, meaning it's still in power, it's still murdering its own people in the streets and taking that war across the borders into Yemen, into Saudi Arabia, and presumably it's going to continue taking that war uh, throughout the Europe and eventually here. That regime is the one setting the terms of debate in this whole nuclear standoff, which is, there are a few words that can describe how pathetic it be. This regime is not only in power, it, is, it feels itself and it is in fact stronger. That is, a, in my view, a damning indictment of our foreign policy. Eight years after 9-11 and one of the leading uh, state sponsors of the Islamist movement is still around and is gloating. Gloating. I, I think I want to tell you about two factors that I think are significant in understanding how we got here. Uh, I, want, I think Alex is going to touch on some of the uh, causes and Iran's going to talk a little bit more about how we can get out of this mess. So just two, two points uh, in closing. In any given war, you have to answer one question, at least one. Who are you fighting? And then what are you going to do to stop them? Those, are, those seem like obvious, they seem like elementary school kind of questions. But you would be surprised at how many wrong answers and evasive answers and misinformed corrupt answers that have been given in the last eight years and prior to that. Because one of the points we, we make in the book is that our problems did not begin with 9-11. They began long before that. And I think the situation with Iran just highlights how badly we've done on this score of naming who the enemy is. So that's one point I want to leave you with. 
And on the second question, what are you going to do about it? What do you consider to be the right thing to do in response, in self-defense? I think the Afghanistan situation is a model of what went wrong in that regard. Because, and this is a point I, I developed in several of the chapters, if you look at the empirical data of what was done in, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq, by the way, it is shocking. Not because of how aggressive America has been, which is the standard line, not because of how stupid our forces have been. All of that is bunk. The truth is that our forces were, were, were abused by our politicians. They were made, they were put into combat, and, not, and, and the problem wasn't they were understaffed or under-equipped. It was that they were prevented from fighting to win. They were given the wrong kinds of orders, orders that, are, that flow from certain moral ideas. And these have, in effect, crippled the war in Afghanistan. And, and I'll tell you more about that if you're interested in the Q&A, and as I said, it's in the book. So these two issues, who are you fighting and what are you willing to do? What, are you, what do you consider to be moral in war? These are the core two issues. And these are policy issues, they're not operational or strategic in any meaningful sense. And that is where we failed. So this is where we are, and I think these are some of the main reasons for it. I'm going to turn it over now to Alex to develop this further. Interestingly enough, yesterday uh, I was in D.C. visiting my family, um, and my girlfriend wanted to see the sites in D.C., so I took her by the various memorials, including the new World War II memorial. And, I mean, I just have to read you the two quotes that, that stuck out to me, and I think it'll be obvious why they stuck out and, and how relevant they are. One is from the beginning of the war. One is from the end of the war. Um, uh, Roosevelt's uh, declaration of war, his announcement to the American people that he's going to declare war, and he says very frankly, no matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. Absolute victory. Four years later, against some of the most fearsome military enemies of all time, Douglas MacArthur could say this, and the title of the, um, the exhibit is The War's End. Today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won. The skies no longer rain death. The seas bear only commerce. Men everywhere walk upright in the sunlight. The entire world is quietly at peace. How many years out do any of us see anything like that, remotely anything like that, being said in this country by anyone? President Bush explicitly said, although he was chastised and tried to recant, that this is not a war that you can win. Barack Obama doesn't like Hirohito as a model. I like Hirohito as a model. So, I mean, all of the examples Ilan brought up, I think, I think are, are perfect um, in, in many ways to illustrate what's going on. And I, I think it's really helpful to, to step back and to realize how abnormal this is. Because when we read the newspaper every day, it's treated as, well, this is normal. So you read the op-ed pages, they comment on certain issues, the news stories cover certain issues, you think, well, this is, this is what's newsworthy. It's being handled in a certain way. There's one position, there's another position. That's, that's pretty much uh, all there is to say about it. And yet, this is clearly not the case with what's going on now. There's no talk whatsoever of, you know, of, of us being able to walk upright in a sunlit world. There's no talk whatsoever of us being free from threats. I mean, just take... Take uh, Afghanistan. I mean, what is Obama going to possibly say that is going to accomplish anything as far as the lives and freedom of Americans go? I mean, nothing. But what's even worse is that that issue is not even on the table. There's no expectation that he meet that standard in a speech. Whereas, can you imagine being F FDR giving a speech and not explaining how, you know, every single Japanese necessary to be exterminated until he reached the goal of Americans being safe, it's, it's just completely incomprehensible. 
So there's something very warped about uh, the discussion of foreign policy today. And I think that uh, is a good segue to the importance of this book, because we're selling a book in a sense. I mean, we're here, here promoting a book and, and we're promoting an institute, the Ayn Rand Institute in our uh, public outreach branch, the Ayn Rand Center. What makes us, you know, on, what is it on uh, Passover? They ask, what makes this night different from all other nights? <laughs> well, what makes this book different from all other books? Well, and, and, and there is something. It's not that Elon just decided to, to add his name to the hundreds and hundreds of people who have written on 9-11 and the war and its aftermath. And I think this goes to what, what the Ayn Rand Institute does, which is we are a philosophical organization. And Ayn Rand was a novelist and a philosopher. And a couple decades ago, this is also a coincidence, she went to West Point, just like Barack Obama will unfortunately be doing uh, tomorrow. And she gave a speech called Philosophy Who Needs It. And in that speech, she argued that the single most practical thing in the world is to think about philosophy and philosophical issues, which if most of you take a philosophy class in college is not the message you get. And the reason she held this is because philosophy is a science that studies the fundamental questions of human life, questions that apply to everyone in every place at every time. Questions like, what is the purpose of your life? What kind of goals should you set? How should you go about achieving them? How, how should you go about finding the answers to all of those questions? What methods should you use? And all of those questions are, are directly relevant to the issue of war, which is what I think makes this, this book distinctive, that it takes a philosophical approach to the issue of when to go to war, why to go to war, how to go to war, and applies it in particular with respect to these issues. So Ilan highlighted the issue of naming the enemy and then figuring out how to defeat it. And it's no accident that this book is overwhelmingly focused on that issue. And that other books you read will treat that issue very tangentially and vaguely and not even particularly care about those answers. But if you're taking a philosophical approach, you have to, you have to ask the fundamental questions. What is going, and the real fundamental question of foreign policy is what is necessary to protect the rights and freedom of Americans from foreign threats? And that leads to many questions, and we'll be discussing them tonight. But one question, just to focus on as an example, is what is the, who is the enemy? And again, it's, it's noteworthy that the cultural discussion on this issue is, is very, very warped. Uh, who is, I mean, who is the enemy in Afghanistan? It is the big T Taliban, little T Taliban. Are the people in Afghanistan the enemy? I mean, we went to war in Iraq. Were we against Iraq? Was it for Iraq? You know, I know, and I just listed today the number of, of names of the enemy that I've heard given by prominent people. So this is not inclusive, all inclusive, but the enemy is the terrorists, it's terror, it's the axis of evil, it's evildoers, it's haters, it's hijackers of a great religion, it's rogue states, it's Al Qaeda, it's shadowy networks of terrorists, it's Islamo fascists, it's tyranny. I mean, what, what exactly, and what do any of those mean? And what are their implications in action? What would it mean to defeat any of these so-called enemies? These are the kinds of issues that need to be thought through clearly. Uh, and, and just to indicate it, and hopefully you'll read the book and, and ask questions to, to get more elaboration on this issue. Um, but in our view, the enemy, we call it Islamic totalitarianism. And it's important to note that it has kind of three characteristics that it's a state-supported, militant, and ideological movement. So it's, it's a movement whose express mission is to politically impose Islam uh, you know, in the Arab Muslim world and the rest of the world through uh, militant action. And it's crucial that it's state-supported because this has major implications for which states we go after. One, you know, the major state we argue that's, that's absolutely necessary to go after is Iran. And just, there, there's a lot to say about how to come to this conclusion. It's not self-evident, so it needs to be argued for, and that's part of the reason why you write a book and not just talk about it for a couple of minutes. But it's, it's relevant to, to contrast, I think, how, how to really think about these issues which, with how it's done conventionally. And I have a quote here from uh, Paul Krugman, who's a very prominent New York Times columnist. And he was writing about how the worst thing possible would be for us to think that Iran was a threat that we should go to war with. So he said, Iran had nothing whatsoever to do with 
In fact, the Iranian regime was quite helpful to the United States when it went after al-Qaeda and its Taliban allies in Afghanistan. So this is the view. If you weren't directly involved in the atrocities of that day, then supposedly you're not you, you know, we shouldn't go after you, but where, where is that written? I mean, how does that make any sense? If you think about it philosophically, the standard is who is an actual threat to the United States? And in uh, the first two chapters of the book, you know, Ilan has uh, excellent essays which trace the development of ir the Iranian threat to the United States from the 1979 hostage taking to today and showing that, that for decades this has been a militant enemy that has been attacking us, that to this day has a death decree against anyone in America or elsewhere associated with the publication of Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses. And they say it's irrevocable. I mean, any decent U.S. foreign policy would say, well, then your lives are revocable and, you know, kill the Iranian government officials responsible for that kind of thing. So it's the, the kind of, um, of philosophical thinking um, the kind of thinking that looks over, that looks at the facts wide range and long range to come to the proper conclusions about what should our basic policy be, what are the enemies, how to defeat them. I think that is completely essential today, and that's why I think this book is really timely. And, and for more, I'll pass it on to Yaron. Thanks, Alex. So let me uh, thank you, Dallas. It, uh, it, it has been a pleasure. Um, both in your living room, and I think this is uh, this is even more fun. Um, so we've heard that we're not winning this war. Indeed, we're losing it. Um, as Elon, I think, demonstrates, the uh, the Taliban and uh, the Islamic totalitarians of Afghanistan are ever more powerful. Uh, not only can you project a future in which they are part of the government. The U.S. government projects a future in which the Taliban is part of that government. Not only the Taliban projects that future. Um, you know, Iraq, in my view, even though it seems to have been pacified, is, is uh, you know, will, I think, in the future uh, be shown to be a satellite of the Iranians, at least as long as the Shiites control Iraq. Iran developing nuclear weapons with nothing in sight. Um, you know, uh, Clerics, so-called radical clerics in the Middle East, communicating with army officials in the United or army uh, offices in the United States, have then gone shooting, shooting rampages. But we don't call that terrorism. We call that, you know, he was just mentally something not good. So terrorism is all around us. Um, Islamic totalitarianism, as the ideology motivating that terrorism, is alive and well and thriving. It's thriving in Israel, uh, you know, in, in, in the Gaza and the West Bank with Hamas. It is thriving in Lebanon with the Hezbollah. It is thriving within the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and Jordan and Syria. Uh, as we said, it's thriving in Iraq and Iran and Yemen. In, I mean, everywhere. Eight years after 9-11, and, and really 9-11 is a somewhat artificial date. I mean, why 9-11? Is that really when the Islamic totalitarians first struck us? No, I mean, uh, today is, is, uh, is 30 years and one month uh, from what I view as the starting date of this war, uh, uh, November 4th, 1979, which was the day the U.S. Embassy was taken in Tehran, uh, the day in which the Islamic totalitarians first attacked the United States. They have been attacking us constantly since, um, but we view each incident as an isolated little event, you know, by some nuts who, you know, wasn't inspired by anything, just happened to be shooting and there were Americans in the way, uh, and they got killed, just like the Fort Hood accident, uh, accident, right, uh, incident, um, and therefore nobody views this as a war. And 9-11, according to the people in power today in the United States, was just an act of criminals. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a part of anything bigger. It wasn't a part of the war. So before you can win a war, you have to first identify it as a war. And I don't think anybody's done that. Even Bush with the war on terrorism didn't truly identify this as a war. Uh, we have for many, many years, uh, going back to the mid-90s, Diamond Institute has, has, has called this a war. 
Um, second, you have to identify the enemy. So a war against whom? And as Alex said, it's not like a terrorism. Right? Terrorism is a tactic. Terrorism is, it would be like identifying, after Pearl Harbor saying, we're going to fight a war against kamikaze pilots. Right? Terrorism is just one tactic. The Iranians are building nuclear weapons. That's not terrorism, so they're not part of this war. So you have to identify who you're fighting against. And we're fighting against an ideology, the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism. This is an ideologically based war. It is freedom, liberty, loving, people of the world against Islamic totalitarianism. That is the war. Unless we define it that way, there's no war to, war. There's no war to fight. There's just no war to fight. And that's why they're floundering all over the place, because they haven't defined the enemy. And then third, we have to have a path to victory. Now people say this is complicated because, you know, there are all these terrorist groups and they're all isolated and Al-Qaeda struck us and how do we know who is an Islamic totalitarian is really the enemy, who isn't the enemy? It's complicated. You know, you can't, you can't fight it like you did World War II. But that is absurd. Because once you identify that it is an ideology that you're fighting, then it's easy. Make a list of all the groups and all the countries that adhere to this ideology and do what we did to the Germans and Japanese in World War II. Destroy them. So that list would include groups like Al-Qaeda, certainly, but it would include Hamas and Hezbollah and the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic Jihad, and all of those groups are part of the enemy and therefore need to be destroyed. Not negotiated with, not evacuate settlements in order to give them their own state, not withdraw in order to give them power, destroy it. And by whatever means necessary, just like we destroyed Japan, we destroyed Germany in order to win. And by the way, you know, the other objection here, whenever I say destroy, people go, oh, you can't do that. They'll be really upset, and then, you know, 1.2 billion Muslims will be our enemies. Well, how many German enemies do we have today? After we flattened Dresden? How many Japanese enemies do we have today after we killed hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians, including using two nukes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? None. No, en no Japanese enemies, no German enemies. It it's funny how it works that way. When you win, you win, and the enemy goes away. And you win by decisively feeding them. Okay, so you list all those groups, you have to destroy them, but then is it the case that all those groups, Hamas, Islam, Jeff, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, do they just exist without any support from any state? Well, no. It's quite obvious that it's not the case. The Taliban, Al-Qaeda, most of the Sunni groups get massive support from uh, Saudi Arabia. All the Shia groups get support from Iran, and Iran, of course, is much more open-minded about these things than the Saudis. They support the Shia, the, Shia, the uh, Sunni groups as well, so they, they support everybody across the board. So you've got two state supporters of terrorism. You've got the Saudis and the Iranians, and of course the Saudis are best friends in this war. Uh, months, at, you know, a couple of months after 9-11, uh, the head of the Saudi royal family, or one of the heads of the royal uh, was was at, at the ranch in Texas and got a big old hug from George Bush. This is in the middle of a war. This is the enemy. And yet, we're their best friends. Uh, and the Iranians, well, you've heard the story about what's going on with the Iranians. So why? And, and I'll, I'll be brief and, and I encourage uh, lots of... Why is, why is it so pathetic? I mean, and, and to call this war anything but pathetic is, is I, I, I don't think there's any other, other way to describe it. And I really think this has to do with what Alex talked about. This has to do with philosophical ideas. This has to do with what's changed in our culture. If, if uh, George Bush had given his speech that he gave after 9-11, right after Pearl Harbor, people would have been in the streets demanding his impeachment. We all thought it was a tough speech. But you go back and read it. You go back and read his speech on 9-11, where, where he talks about, you know, most of the Muslims in the world are good people, they're nice, they're friendly, this is not really that kind of a war. Imagine if he are saying, most Shintus 
a nice, peaceful people. We're not against Shintoism. I mean, he would have been laughed out of office. Um, imagine if FDR had encouraged us all to go shopping at Kohala, which is what George Bush did in his January 2002 speech before Congress, where he said, just act normal, nothing's happened, we'll take care of it, don't worry, be happy. That's not taking, going to war, taking a threat seriously. So what's happened with us? We need to let aside the politicians, they're irrelevant. We are the problem. What's happened to us that we listened to George Bush and thought he was a tough guy? Because our standards have been so watered down. Well, I think that one of the things that happened to us is, is there's no so much culturalism. We have come to, uh, to accept the idea that everybody's equal, everybody's good, everybody's the same, that we should apologize for American greatness and American success, and that Bush was kind of good because he kind of sounded a little bit like a cowboy, at least for, to the European ear, he sounded like a cowboy because he was more self-assertive. So we thought, wow, because self-assertion is bad. You can't be self-assertive about Western civilization, about capitalism, about liberty, about freedom. You know, because slaveries, you know, we've been taught through the multiculturalism debate that slavery is the same. Who are we to say Western civilization is any better than anybody else? You know, uh, Stanley Fish wrote, not bad, right after 9-11. Uh, Stanley Fish was the dean of the humanities at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and he said, look, from the terrorist perspective, they were doing the right thing. They were the good guys. Who are we to say that they're evil? We can say we don't like them because they're killing us, but we can't say they're evil. There's no standard. There's no standard. Those standards are gone. There's no right and wrong. There's just this fuzziness of sameness. Everything's the same. Everything is on the same level. And I think that has its origin in an ethic, in, in going back to the philosophy, in an ethic that is dominating this country and is dominating more and more of this country and has really, you know, over the last hundred years seeped into every aspect of this culture. And that is the notion that pursuing your own self-interest, being a servant, claiming that you're the good guys, knowing that there is something, something that is good, is, is bad, is wrong. It's either the whole individualism, the whole, what made America great, that self-assertion, is wrong. And goodness is being nice to people. Even your enemies, turning out of the cheek, you know, being friendly. The meek shall inherit the earth afterward. after all. We should take care of the meek. You're your neighbor's keeper, and the Palestinians are our neighbors after all, and we should keep them. Um, this otherism, this focus on what's good for other people, not on what's good for ourselves, that is creeped into our culture, and it destroys our foreign policy, it destroys our healthcare debate, it destroys our economy, it's everywhere. This, you know, we call it altruism, otherism. The, the, the idea that self-sacrifice, that self-denial is the moral ideal. That is ideal. And if you're self-assertive, if you pursue your own self-interest, if you're doing what's good for you, if America goes out there and fights for its values, there's something ugh, uncomfortable about that. There's just something wrong about that. That's selfish. That's self-interested. And those have become bad words. But self-sacrifice... You know, doing what's good for the Iraqis. You know, I, we, called, we called the Iraq war very early, from, from really the first weeks of the war, we called it the social services war. We went to Iraq not to beat an enemy, not to destroy an enemy, but to bring them sewers and schools and electricity and, most importantly, democracy, so that they could elect a Shi radical Shiite government to rule over them. We went to war, and, and you can tell, you know, names are important. Who you identify as the enemy is important. Names are important. You remember the name of, of the war in Iraq? It was an operation, you know, Free America, or America asserting itself, or American self-defense. It was Operation Iraqi Freedom. We went to war, 5,000 American, you know, young men and women died in that war for Iraqi freedom, not for our safety. You don't fight a war like that if you're concerned about American safety. You don't drop food packages in Afghanistan while you're dropping bombs 
if what you care about is the safety of Americans. But you can't do that anymore. You have to care for your neighbor. You have to take care of the poor Afghans. And while we're saying Afghanistan now, what is the goal of the Obama administration right now in Afghanistan? Is it victory over the enemy? What was the goal of the Bush administration? Was it victory over? No. We want to bring the democracy. We're worried about the credibility of the president of Afghanistan, whether there's too much corruption or not. Who cares? <laughs> we should be in Afghanistan for one reason and one reason only to destroy our enemy, to destroy any threat to the United States, to beat them, not to bring them the good life, not to worry about who their president is. I don't give a damn what Karzai is or isn't or will be or could be. I want the Taliban and Al Qaeda finished. That's it. That's all we can do. If you see an ethic that says, that the standard of morality of self-sacrifice and the well-being of others, including one's enemies, cannot tolerate that self-assertion. And that is, I think, what we bring to the debate that's different and why you'll hear statements like that from me that, and, and the people up here that you won't hear from other speakers. We believe in American self-interest. We believe that American foreign policy has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to defend the lives and property of American citizens. That's it. And that comes directly from Iron Man's philosophy and ethics of rational self-interest. In the long term, if we're going to win this war, if this country is going to be successful in its future, if it's going to overcome the economic crisis, the political crisis, and the foreign policy crisis, it's going to have to require a philosophical, ethical revolution, not just tinkering with policy here and there. So thank you all, and we'll open it up to questions. Is, is Obama a Muslim? Is this Obama the Islamic enemy in the White House? Well, no, I wish it was that easy or simple. No, because, you know, Obama's really, really, really bad. But so is everybody else. I mean, Obama's worse than that, but so is everybody else. There's nothing, Obama is not some Muslim implant who's going who's gonna to destroy America from the within. Obama's an American implant. The problem is here. The problem is us. We get the politicians we deserve. There's nothing about Obama we didn't know before the election that has materialized since. Um, but there was nothing special about Bush. Bush got us into this position. He didn't win the war in Afghanistan. He didn't win the war in Iraq. He didn't, you know, he was the one who, the first president in American history to declare that the Palestinians had to have their own state. You know, he helped the Hamas get Gaza by pressuring Israel to withdraw from, from the Gaza Strip and to have democracy, right? The whole idea of democracy. How did Hamas get into power? Because 56% of Palestinians voted for them to get into power. Um, people forget the fruits of democracy uh, that occurred in, among the Palestinian Authority. So, you know, there's nothing... Yes, again, Obama's worse and he's undercut this and he makes it, in a sense, he makes the, the, the choices that we have more real and, and, and... But this is a much deeper problem than any one, uh, any one president or any one individual or any one political party. This is a problem in American culture. We're not demanding victory. Why, why aren't people marching in Washington right now if Obama's the problem? Why, why aren't we waking up and marching in Washington and demanding that, that, you know, we either win in Afghanistan or bring the troops home. We're the problem. I, I just want to add one thing to that. <clears throat> I agree. It, it, if it were that simple, we would just remove him from office. Well, I think there, I think his answer bears on this fully. But let me add that in America and in Europe especially, what we did see is not people marching in the streets demanding victory. But people marching in the streets in advance of any bullets flying, decrying that we had no right to defend ourselves. Or demand now they're going to be marching for withdrawals all over the place, regardless of what the consequences might be. So I, I agree with your point that there's, there's definitely a cultural issue. 
And I wanted to amplify one thing that you said. In many ways, you know, you can put a lot of this on President Bush because of the way he conducted the war. And the big focus of the book is the Bush, uh, the two terms of President George W. Bush. But you, you must take a broader perspective on this because in, just as 9-11 wasn't in, in any material sense the starting point, Bush wasn't the starting point of what went wrong. The, the big failure that we've had has been ongoing and multiplying since at least 1979. And there's a case to be made for it even before that when the Islamist movement was just emerging. And so what you have is Jimmy Carter, Democrat, Ronald Reagan, Republican, George W. H. Bush, Republican, Bill Clinton, Democrat. And each of them, and this is one thing I, I, I argue in the book with a lot of evidence, they all have culpability. So I don't think it's, it's as simple as, well, we can just, we just need to evict the Democrats or the liberals more generally from power and really you know, expose their flaws. We need to expose their flaws in their irrational policy. But we have to be just as, we have to bring just as much scrutiny uh, on the policies of other uh, uh, presidents, including the ones on the right, or ostensibly on the right. Because one of the big, I, to me, I come from the United, King, United Kingdom, and to me, one of the impressive things about the American right has been its tradition of being tough on foreign policy. And the more I study American foreign policy, the more I find that that's an irony. I mean, it isn't true. I, I wish it were true, but it's not. So I think there's a lot of blame to share, uh, unfortunately. Next question. Uh, all right, I'll start with this in part because a lot of the work I do uh, is the history of, of oil. So I think there's a lot of misunderstanding as far as uh, outside of to what extent oil influences our foreign policy, in particular um, oil having nations. So first of all, if you take Obama or anyone else in the, the past 30 years, it's, it's very tempting to look at the results, which are horrific, and to then suppose that there must be some conspiracy behind these results. But it's not the case at all. No, the way to realize that is to look at the arguments for the policies that led to the results. And the arguments are very conventional. For example, democracy, as in, in the pure sense of unlimited majority rule, is a good thing. Or we are a brother's keeper. Um, or terrorists are just you know a fringe who've hijacked a great religion and they're stateless, shadowy networks. So these are, it's, it's completely an intellectual battle. The policies that are being implemented are being implement, implemented in broad daylight using ultimately philosophical premises that we have ta been taught and internalized from a young age. And Yaron mentioned the idea of altruism, the idea of placing others before self, which is a major thing that we expose in many policies, including the whole conception of a welfare war in Iraq and a welfare war in Afghanistan. We show how this is really underlying so much. So all of these things are either in broad daylight or if you, you can look under the arguments and see beliefs that you and others hold uh, underlying them. So in terms of what, how, Sa so the idea that Saudi Arabia has any sort of fundamental influence over this has, has no truth whatsoever. And if you just look at the history of our conduct with regard to um, oil possessing regimes, it, it does bear on the current conflict, but in the exact opposite way most people presuppose. Uh, starting in 1901, you had Western involvement in Persia, and around 1937, you started having Western involvement in Saudi Arabia uh, and many other nations in between. And there's a consistent pattern, which was that the nations in question made sort of ironclad contracts with oil developers who discover oil at great time and expense. In the case of Saudi Arabia, it took 13 years, and they thought there was no oil there. At the time, the, the entire uh, treasury of Saudi Arabia could be carried on the back of a camel. So you, you, you have an idea of, of the upgrade of standard of living that these oil companies were bringing. In any case, they, they had these ironclad contracts that Western nations had promised to enforce, namely Britain enforcing the original Persian oil contract uh, in Persia. And what happened was, over the oil companies made heroic discoveries against all odds, and the Western governments renounced their obligation as soon as, as uh, you know, what be later became Iran threatened nationalization in the 30s. And this set off a pattern that would continue throughout the 20th century, which is that oil that, that morally and by contract belonged to Western companies was stolen and nationalized by thuggish regimes 
that we had every military ability to defeat, but that for reasons of cowardice and ultimately moral ideas, where we, the strong, thought it was wrong to hurt the poor Saudis uh, or the poor Iranians, where for those reasons we demonstrated cowardice and refused to claim what was rightfully the property of, of Britons and Americans. And because we did that, we had a legacy that, that made possible the Shah, who was, who was bad, not because he was bad for Iranians, but because he was horrific to the United States, only trumped by Khomeini in, in both respects. But the entire, so a lot of what even set the context for 1979 for, which is the focus of the book, was uh, our appeasement of the Arab world. So the idea that, that they're somehow pulling the strings in their favor is absurd. I mean, morally, we let them pull the strings, uh, and anyone else who attacks us pull the strings. So, uh, thanks. I just want to add to that, because you, what you raised in part of your question was a concrete solution. And we certainly need one. And one of the things I tried to do in the last chapter is spell out in step by step what that would look like. And there are lots of ways we could solve the problem. And I, I definitely want to impress upon you, uh, there's one thing you take away from tonight, is that as bad as things are, the point is to work towards a solution. It's not to wallow in how bad it is. We, we, it is a means to an end. We need to understand how we got here in order to get out of it. So please remember the first word of the title is winning the unwinnable war. Um, and so, as I said, I refer you to that chapter for a fuller explanation, but let me just touch on two points that bear on this. It is true, and this is to uh, agree with Iran, that there's a cultural problem of which our foreign policy is one symptom, for sure. There's a bigger problem, and foreign policy just reflects it. And we certainly need to change the culture's ideas so that they're more American. I mean, one of the reasons people flocked to this country for hundreds of years is because this was the land of opportunity, freedom, and prosperity for those who earned it. I know that's why I came here. I know this is what attracted you and so many other people who are immigrants to this country. We need to be more like that. And that means a culture that's more individualist, that takes capitalism seriously and defends it as opposed to selling it off. Now, that is a big task, and that's one of the projects that our organization is involved with. Our, our mission is to affect change in the culture at that level. But that means taking on issues one by one, and then the one that this book focuses on is foreign policy. So to zoom in on that issue, I think there are a couple of things we can do that are concrete. The first one is to declare in the kind of language and, and, and the kind of rhetoric and mean it that we heard uh, Alex read these quotes from World War II. We need to have an orientation to the problem that puts American interests first. And not just first in a series, but first, period. Nothing else. And that has far-reaching implications for what you do on the ground. Do you drop Islamic compliant food uh, uh, packages with peanut butter and, and, and dried crackers on Afghanistan on November 15th, 2001? No. Do you send as many people in to destroy the enemy as is necessary? Yes. But, so th there's definitely concrete implications. Now, in the book, one of the things I try to do is to take not just Iran, not just the nuclear issue, as important as it is, and not just Afghanistan or Iraq. I take them all and, and I lay out a sequence of events that I think we could follow. And it doesn't have to be all of them, but it could be, we need to do some of them are necessary. And this begins with defeating the enemy. Iran has been telling you that it's an ideology. It's an ideology led by particular states. And I would name Iran as the chief leader of this movement. Uh, I refer you to the book for the fuller argument. Saudi Arabia is a financier and an ideological wellspring. But in terms of actually putting people on the ground with expertise in bomb making, with expertise in, in uh, uh, weapons and training, it is Iran, by far, beyond any other competitor in the field. The starting point, the road to victory, as the final chapter is titled, runs through Iran. That is the starting point. You need to defeat the regime, and, and, and not merely 
retard its nuclear program by a few years, which is what a lot of people would tell you in terms of a military response, that is not enough. Because even if they never have nuclear weapons, they're enough of a threat as they are. Their tentacles reach far and wide, and that has to be stopped. The reason the pick it is not merely its history of aggression over 30 plus years. It is its central role as the inspiration for this movement. I'll give you just one anecdote. Uh, Ayman Zawiri, he's number two in Al-Qaeda, right? He's, uh, you know, he's kind of the ideas guy, and Bin Laden is the operations kind of mastermind, in, in the sense of he's the charismatic one. Gives you a flavor of what he's like. Now, Ayman Zawiri, in 1979, was the leader of a group called Al-Jihad in Egypt. And when the Iranian Revolution happened, when Ayatollah Khomeini brought an Islamic Republic into being, this sent real blast waves across the Middle East. And one of the people who was affected by this was Zawiri. He looked at Khomeini and he realized that the world was different now. If Iran can exist, if, if the Islamist Revolution can overcome the more powerful forces of the Shah, and, uh, which was backed by Washington, if they can win, then nothing's really standing in our way. So in, in kind of a macro level of being inspired by that revolution, and then in concrete, specific things that they did, like they mimicked the... Uh, Khomeini used tape cassette, cassette tapes, if you remember what those are, to propagate his message in Iran. So they said, well, that's what we should do. And, you know, in the months after the revolution in Egypt, which is not exactly a theocracy, it's considered fairly modern and fairly moderate and fairly friendly. There were placards of Ayatollah Khomeini on street courts. So there's this big wave of inspiration in 79, and it really empowered the Islamic totalitarians, who later became parts of Al-Qaeda, because Zawiri's organization blended with Al-Qaeda, and then there's other groups and splinter groups. I won't bore you with all that detail, but the, 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 the theme is that Iran has been uh, an intellectual inspiration. It has proven the viability of this cause in, in idea, intellectual terms, and in practice. The Iranians, I mean, listen to uh, bin Laden. He will tell you that the Islamic fighters in Lebanon in 1983, after the U.S. barracks was bombed by Iranian uh, oper operatives, he looks upon that as, well, we jihadists managed to kick the U.S. out of Lebanon. Right? So they take the, the, the inspiration at an intellectual level, and they take it at a concrete level of, we can win. And everything that's happened in the last 30 years has just confirmed that, even more so when Iran is labeled the axis of evil, part of the axis of evil. And eight years, was eight years later, President Bush, who came out with that statement, with that slogan, He's no longer in power, and Iran is. Right? The same people who were evil then are still evil, except no one in this country is willing to name themselves. So, so, just to sum this up, the concrete things we need to do all depend on taking an orientation to the problem that puts our interests first. And that includes identifying the enemy and doing whatever it takes to defeat it. And I, I think for many reasons, including the ones I mentioned, Iran is a starting point. And once you do that, and, and you have to do it and say, it's not something you do and then kind of hush it up. You have to say, we're taking on Iran for these reasons, and publicly state them, and catalog it, and expose their evil, and take a stand and show that you are morally courageous. You're, you're not going around the Middle East apologizing for what you're doing. You're saying, we believe we have the right to do this, and these are our reasons. And when you do that, all the cockroaches will begin to scurry. Because there's no, they're nothing more than that. I mean, if you take a, a real stand, look, this is what we should have done, I think, 30 years ago, they would have fled. I mean, the, the story of, of the embassy hostage taking needs to be explored at greater length. And more Americans need to know this. The, in the first 36 hours of the crisis, Khomeini sat on his hands. He didn't want to publicly endorse the students, although they were working on his, at his behest. And he didn't want to uh, uh, repudiate them. Do you know why? 
He was afraid. He didn't know what America would do. He heard rumors and he had reason to fear that the United States, the mightiest lion, would roar and come after him and destroy his new Islamic Republic. 36 hours went by, and Khomeini told his people, those rumors? The United States cannot do a damn thing. And it was 444 days later before the Iranians decided it was time to give up the U.S. hostages. So, it is to the extent to which we demonstrate our weakness and our refusal to assert our own interests that empowers them. And this is cataloged in the book at length. So, I'll turn this to you if you had... I'm fine. The, the first thinker that uh, you could, I think, identify with just both theory is Augustine, uh, the uh, the Christian philosopher, the theologian of the what third or fourth century, fourth century, fifth century. Uh, very early on, uh, Augustine is the first one to articulate uh, what later became known as just war theory. He talks Aquinas built on that. Um, it is probably a little bit of better thinker, I think, than, uh, in terms of his interpretation. Um, but it, it really comes out of a Catholic tradition of uh, trying to apply the principles of the Catholic Church to warfare. Um, and there's something even contradictory right there. Um, and it, ba basically the idea of just war theory is to come up with rules. Uh, rules about war. When, it's, when you should go to war, under what conditions, and how you should fight war. Uh, but it comes at it from that Catholic uh, tradition of love thy neighbor like yourself, uh, turn the other cheek. So war is, is a last resort, for example, is one of the principles of just war theory. But they mean last resort, you know. Uh, and you can see it right now. After you negotiate with the Taliban and you beg them and you ask them and you pay them and you bribe them and you give them everything, then if they still bomb you, then maybe you do something about it. That's last resort, and, um, you know, proportionality, and they have a whole set of principles, and the idea of applying morality to war is a good idea. If the morality you're trying to apply is a good morality, it might be, if you apply a corrupt morality to war, then you get just war theory, which is what Catholics, but if you want, later on, um, I mean, in the, in the 18th century, there were some better thinkers in just war theory, um, uh, coming out of Europe and the Enlightenment, uh, but then today's lead thinker, today the guy who everybody reads and everybody at West Point and uh, what they study is a guy named Michael Walter. Um, and really the chapter that we talk about Just War Theory is, is it really of course his interpretation of Just War Theory primarily. But the whole tradition is altruistic, fundamentally altruistic. Uh, Michael Walter, whose book is taught in, again at all the military academies, is really the guy if you want to see what Just War Theory is about. Yeah, just one quick thing on, on just war theory. Uh, it's it's notable that there's no other moral theory of war that there is. So it's it's just war theory in any era means the culture's view of just. So we criticize the view very heavily and show how destructive it is to America. But that really raises questions about what kind of view of justice do we have as as a culture that leads to those kinds of results? And it's not a pretty picture. My position is this. I am, am not interested in the internal debate in Islam about what Islam is and what Islam isn't. I don't really care. I don't care what Islam is or isn't. I just care about identifying those people who want to enslave me. I care about identifying that thread within Islam. And it might be a dominant thread, it might turn out that it's Everybody, it might turn out, but it's a minority. That's an empirical question. Um, that threat within Islam that wants to impose Sharia law on me and that wants to kill me and my children. I need, we need to destroy them before they get that chance of doing that. If we identify the enemy as Islamic totalitarianism and crush them, what's left of Islam would moderate, would change, would, you know, it would be something else. And I don't care what it is, that's their problem, it's not mine. If their religion is a bad religion, that's their problem. The point is we need to identify the enemy and crush them. 
The enemy is not my Muslim neighbor who loves America and considers himself a Muslim and, and practice his version of Islam. And I don't want to say his is the right version or his is the wrong version. I don't care. All I care about, to repeat myself, is these guys have said that they want to kill me. They said they want to impose Sharia on me. Anybody who says those two things is my enemy and they need to be destroyed. And, you know, let, let Islam figure out what it wants to be after that. But first you have to destroy the enemy. I mean, no, I want to say something about individual rights. Because I think it's, it's really... I, I, I can sort of sympathize with characterizing the enemy as Islam, sort of, but as a matter of, of rights, it's, it's a really, really wrong thing to do. Because what you're saying is that the government, which is the agency of force, is declaring as its enemy the ideas in people's head. So I just want to make very clear, when we say the enemy is Islamic totalitarianism, I, I stress this is a state-supported militant movement. So it is people who, based on the ideas in their head or whatever, are taking up arms against us to violate rights. We're the Ayn Rand Center for Individual Rights. We're not the Ayn Rand Center for randomly attacking people based on ideas. So the standard of when we get involved and when people are our enemies, are they threatening our individual rights? And only that. So if a person could be a Muslim, if he doesn't take up arms, our government has absolutely nothing to say about his religion. Let me just give the audience a few context-setting remarks on Pakistan, because. Uh, it is definitely one of the areas where we have a great deal to worry about from the Islamist movement. I mentioned that the Pakistan-Afghanistan border is the new epicenter for this movement in terms of their having free reign. And as you know, uh, you mentioned this, the Pakistani regime has nuclear weapons. And as you have read in the paper, the Islamists are trying to take over Pakistan and they, they've come within about 60 miles or a day's drive of the capital. And there's reason to believe that they might well succeed. Uh, th there's a long history between the regime in Pakistan, various regimes in Pakistan, and the Islamists in Afghanistan. They've colluded in support, and they, they appear to be still in cahoots. So uh, I think the question uh, can be framed more generally than who's in charge of the, their nukes, because that's certainly a question to be worried about. The question I have is, why are you, do we even have to care about Pakistan now? Why, what, what happened, right? I mean, the, the story was that they were the, one of the three regimes that supported the Taliban when they were in power in the 1990s. And after 2001, they cut a deal, right? The deal was, we'll stop supporting these Islamists, and we'll stop supporting this so-called war on terror, right? And in return for this, it wasn't done out of their goodwill. In return for this, they received a, a huge package of aid, something to the tune of three, four billion dollars, which recently was tripled. Now, the crisis with Pakistan would not exist today were it not for the way that deal was made. The deal was the U.S. decided it was not going to pass judgment on Pakistan. It was just going to pretend that what Pakistan tells us is the truth. And so we didn't classify them as part of the enemy, which in fact they were. And instead we pretended that they were an ally. And this ally took our money, took your money and my money, and used it to buy weapons to use in Kashmir and other places, and to train its own people. Meanwhile, supporting and continuing to fund a lot of these Islamist groups, and to let them rearm under their own noses in, in the borderlands. This went on for years, and what was the response? Well, it's, one of the things I mentioned about Afghanistan was that our forces were prevented from fighting. They were held back under rules of engagement that put the security of the people in Afghanistan ahead of victory. This is what Muran was characterizing as a, a self-effacing approach to war, a self-crippling kind of war. And that applies as well to what we did with Pakistan. We had every right to pursue the Islamists across the border and defeat them, because that's where they went. When, when we went into, into Afghanistan in 2001, we didn't defeat the Taliban, we just scattered them, right? Then they fled, they fled across the border. And it, once they were across the border, they had immunity, because we didn't want to trespass on Pakistan's sovereignty. 
Well, Pakistan doesn't have sovereignty there because these people, <laughs> it's lawless, right? And the problem is, we approach Pakistan with the same kind of self-effacing approach. We're not going to assert ourselves and say, look, we're not going to have to pay you to be on our side. You have to choose. You either against us as you have to materially change your ways. They didn't change their ways. They took our money and they betrayed us. So that's a case where we had two kinds of failing. One, we failed to recognize what we were dealing with, and then we compounded it by not asserting ourselves over time. I mean, this was under Bush's, uh, uh, um, while he was in office, and it's continuing today. So now we have this mess where we, you know, the, the, the rhetoric is Pakistan is crucial to the fight. On the other hand, everyone in Pakistan, except a couple of people, hate the United States. Just look at the recent poll numbers that have come out, and how we do this and the, the, the Pakistani people, by and large, despise the United States. They government's cooperation with us to the extent that they do cooperate is a betrayal. The soldiers in the Pakistani military are the ones who are helping the Taliban cross the border, the ones who are shooting down U.S. aircraft, and they're the ones who are sabotaging whatever efforts are being done. That is the mess we're in, and I maintain that it has arisen as a result of not taking seriously the principle of self-defense and self-assertion and, and our own interests. Because our own interests are not to become friends with and bribe President General Musharraf and pretend that what he's doing is really helping anything. What does he do? He rounds up about 500 of these Taliban, puts them in prison, then the next day they're all released. It's, just, it's a photo op. That's not a war. So we have this mess with Pakistan. I think, that, and this is part of what I argue uh, that we could do, when you start dealing with a problem, you, you, you go after Iran, you start to demoralize this movement, then you put Pakistan on the defensive and say, you have to live up to this ultimatum. You do everything in your power to defeat the ones, the Islamists in your borders, or let us do it. One of those two things has to happen, and if you fail or refuse, we're going to treat you as an enemy. And that means that there are a whole host of things we can do to severely punish the Pakistani regime. It doesn't mean going to war with them, but we don't have to go to war with every regime that's hostile to us. There are so many more things we can do with moral suasion and real, real uh, assertion of power. So that's kind of a big context for what's gone wrong with Pakistan, and I think it all feeds into the same theme of how is our foreign policy uh, sacrificed our own self-interest over time. And that's what's happening now. I mean, I mentioned in passing that they tripled aid to Pakistan. Triple what they've already received to not do what they're doing, what they didn't do. I think it's ridiculous. It's not a numbers game. It's not. It doesn't matter how many people die. It's an issue of ideas. If we're willing to sacrifice 3,000 and do nothing, why not 3 million? You know, are we willing to watch Israel disappear off the face of the map? Of the map, oh, that six million? Would then we wake up? You really think so? Um, this is not a numbers game. This is not let's wait for the next big terrorist attack and then. This is an ideological game. This is an issue of education. Somebody asked before, what do we need to do? And, and what we need to do is educate, educate, educate. Uh, we need to get the American people to the point where after the next large terrorist attack, we do something. And by the way, I suggest that one of the ways we do that is by changing our language. They're not terrorists. They're Islamic totalitarians, they're enemies. Terrorism is just a tactic again. Iran is not just about terrorism, it's about nuclear weapons, it's about you know defeating Israel in a war. It's a lot of different things. So, I, you know, I really don't think, you could put it this way, people do not learn from experience. In spite of anything you've ever heard, people don't learn from experience. If they've got bad ideas, they'll come to the same rotten conclusion after every occurrence that happens to them. They won't learn, they never will. You can see that in economics all the time. You know, we, we, get, a, we get a crash, and we make all the same mistakes we made in the past, and we get the same results that we got in the past, and 
Everybody's shocked that it didn't work this time, right? The stimulus has never worked. This is an economic example. Stimulating economy through government spending never works to revive an economy in the way that this is different. And we try every single time. Because ideologically, we're conditioned that that's the only solution. The only solution. And it, unless, and it's not even an American consciousness, it's not even a possibility of actually asserting ourselves and going after, out there and defeating the enemy. Nobody talks like that, except a few marginalized people, you know, the, the people try to marginalize the place. I know what he talks about. So we need to make that part of the American consciousness. We need to make that part of the debate. We need to bring up the idea. There is an enemy. It can be defeated. We need to defeat it. We need to say it over and over and over again in conversations. So that when the next terrorist attack happens, and it will happen, and it doesn't matter if 20 people die, the Americans will say, yes, there's an enemy. We need to defeat it. But unless you go through that educational process, they won't get to that point. They, they could nuke New York tomorrow. Let's say a nuke goes up tomorrow in New York. But who's to blame? We are at our fault. Sure. It, you know, it's probably our fault because because of what we did in New York, right? We were we were mean to those people. But how do you? What do you do? I mean, was it Al Qaeda? Let's say it's Al Qaeda. Well, who is Al Qaeda? Where are they? They're in caves in Pakistan. So what do we do about that? Um, can we link it to the Iranians? Let's say we can't. So we won't do anything about Iran because we can't prove that it's there. It, nothing changes just because something bad happens. You've got to get people thinking differently about you know, the, the threat that we're facing. Just a, a quick comment on that. Uh, the, the World Trade Center was attacked in 2001, as we all know. But it was attacked in 1993. And in the plan then, if you if you heard of this, was, was there was a rider truck, a moving truck loaded with explosives, and the plan was to topple one tower into the next. It was, I mean, Same plan. they would have killed as many, if not more, people in 1993. That, I, I, I suggest to you, was one of the attacks in this war against us. And yet, there was no identification of this as part of a war. There was no identification of this as part of an ideological uh, movement that was behind it, which it was. That is just, I think, a, the refutation of the idea that if there were another attack, this would change things, because certainly fewer people were injured in 1993, uh, but it was still an attack, and, and it, its impact could have been far greater. So, uh, and, and I, there's other, one more thing I want to say. I really object to the view that people often have that if only there were another attack, because we don't, I mean, unfortunately I think there might well be another massive attack, but the implication that if only there were one, then something good would happen, in the sense that we would finally wake up, that is not the way to think about this. It is not, we, we should not be waiting for another shoe to drop. We should not be waiting for more people to die. If anything, if I can leave you with one more thing besides the first thing I told you about, is that we need for there to be no more Americans to die. Not a single one, not in the battlefield, not in a skyscraper, not in a bus, nowhere. That is what the kind of foreign policy that I advocate aims at. And that is what we should aim for. It's not, well, you know, once we get to this point and people will finally wake up they won't wake up. We have to wake them up now. We have to inject the right kind of thinking into their minds. And then people will wake up and realize that we've been at war for so long and they've been asleep. How do you do that? Well, I, I suggest that there's a book at the back of the room that would <laughs> contribute in some small way to that endeavor with autographs. You know, there is only one enemy, and that's the enemy within. Because think about who we're fighting. We're fighting a bunch of cave dwellers with no technology, with nothing. This should be like a three-week walk, six-day walk, maybe. Um, there's no real threat out there that can't be dealt with like this if we had the will to deal with it. There is only one enemy, and that is us. That is in America. It's in our universities. It's in our schools. But other than terror, terror, how do we deal with it? No, but how do we deal with it is, is there is only one way to deal with it, and that's speak up. 
But challenge the fundamentals. You got to challenge the ethics. You got to challenge the philosophy behind their ideology. I, with all due respect, McChrystal, McChrystal, right? McChrystal's a win. McChrystal believes in a way of fighting a war that will never, ever achieve victory. If only he was the killer that you think he is. I mean, where's Patton? Where's MacArthur? Where's, uh, where, is, where is a Sherman who is willing to burn one of his most loved cities, the city of Atlanta, which he lived and which he loved, but he knew that burning Atlanta and ravishing the South and destroying the infrastructure of the South would end that war and would lead to victory. He was willing to do that. We won't do it to you. He's never going to do you know, to the enemy who were, who were, who were brothers, right? The Civil War, they were brothers. But he, he fought for a righteous cause and he was willing to, to do whatever was necessary to win. We don't have generals like that. But what we need is to advocate philosophically for the right position. And look, this is not a, a, a challenge that we're going to win overnight. This is a long-term battle. This is a battle to change the culture in this country, to take it back. Uh, to take it forward, if you will. Uh, and it's not going to be easy, but it has to be done at the philosophical level. And that's what the, you know, our institute is structured to do. We start in high schools, at university programs. We're trying to get this message of rational self-interest or American self-assertion into all those institutions. And there are no shortcuts. There's no, I don't have a one-liner that will convince your liberal friend that, uh, you know, it's okay for America to be self-assertive in the world. You have to challenge multiculturalism. You have to attack multiculturalism. It is a theory of ideas that is destroying the ability of Americans to think. That is a long-term battle. There are, no, there are no easy ways out of it. And this is all common sense, right? Anything we say, the common sense is not the way to think. We did instigate a war between Sunnis and Shias, and that, that is, I think, one of the issues that happened in Iraq. We, you know, the, the great result of liberating and bringing elections was to empower the rival sects in that country and they went at each other and started slitting throats and you know, bodies turned up in morgues. Um, to, just to go to your, the, the main thrust of your point, um, I am not in favor of sending any American troops into harm's way unless the point of their being there is to defeat the enemy. Now, I, in the book, I, I present one possible solution, and it involves some of what you're describing, but I think there has to be a certain point at which what you're describing works. Let me just spell out what I think. Right now, we, we've got ourselves into an impossible situation. On the one hand, if we just withdraw right away that hands of victory to the enemy, which we will never live down, they will be spinning this for generations and, and, and using it to, to recruit and empower. It is disastrous if we leave right away, regardless of what you're talking about. Afghanistan, Iraq, you name it. But if you send more troops in, which is now the debate, how many troops, not whether, how many troops, that's just going to put more Americans in harm's way, who, as I argue in the book, are going in with their hands tied behind their backs. You know, don't just take it from me. Read what they say and watch the videos of, of troops in Afghanistan, and they will tell you their biggest complaint is not a lack of armor, it's not a lack of Humvees, it's not a lack of anything that they can be supplied with. It is the number of restrictions on them. And McChrystal, whom you, you, uh, you described as a wimp, that's probably too charitable. Because, well, let me explain why. He is a, one of the advocates of the current strategy, which is you go in there and you win them over with goodies. You give them money, you win Schools, you, you show them that they're better off siding with us. This is, you know, part of what they did in Iraq to temporarily pacify it. But Crystal's complaint about the U.S. military when he did his review of what's been going on is that our troops spend too much time in the Humvee protecting themselves. Instead of that, he should, they should be out in the streets taking as many risks as the Afghan people do. He wants American troops to go out of their way to risk their lives for the sake of Afghans. So if there's anyone who advocates the policy that I argue has been destroying us and, and sabotaging our foreign policy, he is one of the greater proponents of it. So, you know, to say he's a wimp goes, probably doesn't go far enough. 
Now, what about just leaving it out? I said, I think we lose either way, and that's part of what, you, what results when you have an irrational foreign policy. You get into a predicament with Afghanistan. What do we do now? If you send more troops in without the goal of victory, you're sending them to their graves for nothing. But if you withdraw, then you will have another Taliban regime that's a huge threat. Now, I think there's an answer to that. I don't want to leave you the impression that I think it's an impossible situation that you know, can't be resolved, but it's impossible on the current terms of debate, which are, how much nation building are we going to do in, that, in Afghanistan? Because there is no debate. I mean, the debate is, we have to do nation building. We have to win them over. What happened to, what happened to victory? What happened to the, the end of the threat? It's not on the table. And that's part of what I advocate. That has to be an option. It can't just be, you know, we're going to play this Russian roulette with how many lives we're going to throw in, how many lives of Americans we're going to put in harm's way in Afghanistan. And it's going to be, well, some of us want to do 40,000, some want 30,000, some want 20,000. That is such a callous way of dealing with, our, with policy. I mean, it is not our Washington's position to, dispo to be disposing of these people's lives for the sake of what are in effect hostile populations. But the logic So let, let, let me say what we propose. And I'll try to do it quickly. But let, let me first challenge one point you made. Hassan, of course, is a product of state sponsored terrorism. He would have never been radicalized the way he was radicalized if not Saudi is building mosques in America with a radical mosque and an Al Qaeda based mosque. The, 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 she, the, uh, the uh, guy he communicated with in Yemen is a state sponsored terrorist. I mean, he is a product of state sponsored terrorism, not directly, but indirectly. If, if you stop state sponsorship of terrorism, People like Hassan wouldn't exist, or they would be so marginalized that they wouldn't be significant. Look, if you went in tomorrow, what we are advocating is this, to put it in blunt terms. We're advocating to take the troops in Afghanistan and in Iraq, at least I'm advocating this. Take them, put them on the Iranian border, give the Iranian regime 24 hours to, to evacuate to, to, uh, to uh, Toronto, where they own a lot of land. If they don't, march those troops to Tehran, not to build the roads, not to do anything, but to destroy that regime. In, on the way, you destroy and kill whatever's necessary you know, to reach Tehran and to win. After that, after that, you turn to the Pakistanis, just like you mentioned, and you say to the Pakistanis, you see what we just did to Tehran? You see the dust? It used to be buildings. That's what we'll do to you if you don't stop supporting the Taliban or if you don't take the Taliban threat seriously and deal with it. And that's it. It's over. The whole thing is over at that point. The point is that you have to establish America's credibility that it will fight and win a war. But if you evacuated Afghanistan today and said, oh, you Pakistanis, if you do something, we'll come after you, they'll laugh us out. They'll say, you guys haven't stood up for yourself since World War II. You, you've messed up Korea, you've messed up Vietnam, you've messed up every war you've been engaged in, you, you evacuated Somalia, or you evacuated Lebanon, you, you, you bought out Iraq, right? We handed suitcases of cash to the insurgents, that's how we won that war. This, you know, we don't believe a word you say. So, yes, at some point, you can step back and say, if you misbehave, we'll thrash you. But that has to be credible, and the only way to make it credible is to thrash somebody. I mean, that's a tactical issue. How you exactly do it is is a technical issue. That's not the the principle is victory. I mostly want to repeat what I said earlier, which is that um, the ideas of if you take Obama and Axelrod and any of these other characters. They hold, they hold essentially the same ideas that most of us uh, regard as good. They're doing it in the name of be thy brother's keeper. You know, society has an obligation to help the needy. We as a rich country have an obligation to help the poor countries. There's no mystery here. Now, maybe there's some sort of psychological analog to the ideas that we accept uh, having certain psychological consequences as a, as a culture. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I couldn't say, but as the Ayn Institute, we're focused on the philosophical ideas that are out in the open and educating the public with the proper philosophical ideas as a framework as to how to look at these problems objectively, how to solve them. And, you know, there's no mystery, there's no conspiracy, there's just a lot of hard intellectual work 
in terms of changing the way people think about this issue. And then we, you know, I, I don't even focus on this stuff most of the time. I'm, I mostly focus on business. Business is the same thing. How do they, why do they think a stimulus is a solution? Why do they always think that, uh, that greed is the problem and government is the solution? The whole thing is just is an intellectual revolution to, to reconceptualize, to change the way we think about issues. And unfortunately, people think about issues in, in a way that's not uh, objective and rational. And that, that requires education, 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 as Yaron said. Okay. Question here. I, just wanted, I had a thought that I didn't get a chance to just say uh, briefly, I promise. You know, Yaron made the point eloquently, I think, when he said we need to earn credibility because we, we don't have it anymore. Um, and the, the vision that we put forward is not that America has to be trigger happy or, or a war monger, as some people regard America. It's quite the contrary, that if you show that you have the moral backbone and the self-confidence to take a stand, and if you do earn that credibility, you don't have to unholster your weapon. That is one of the benefits of having an assertive foreign policy. So in regard to that gentleman's question about the tactics, there are many ways we can do this, and, and there are options, but the key is to demonstrate that we will not be affronted, that we will, we will tolerate no attacks on Americans, ever. And once you have that and you've established it, the other problems in the region, Pakistan and the rest of it, those become much simpler to solve, much simpler. When people around the Middle East are laughing at us and listening to our president grovel an apology, we have a problem with credibility, all right, because they don't take us seriously. But when you have the opposite, when they look up to us and they say, okay, we're not gonna mess with them. You know, I think that the danger is, there is a danger, and this is, I think, more so in Europe than it is here. The danger is that as a backlash to the rise of Sharia and the rise of Islam in Europe, what you get is not rational, freedom-loving, liberty-loving, individual rights-respecting cultures coming about, but you get a rebirth of European fascism, which I think we're all very familiar in this group with. Uh, I don't take the vote about the minarets as a good sign. I think it's a bad sign. Minarets are not the enemy. The enemies much realer than that. We should be able to live in a culture in which, who cares if you want to build a minaret or whatever, or a cross or anything. The point is that Sharia law, you know, it cannot and will not exist because we believe in individual rights of freedom and liberty. But they don't believe in individual rights of freedom and liberty. They just take the symbol and they attack it out of context and out of context of what the real threat is. If the Swiss said, we should fight Islamic totalitarianism, and as part of that battle, we're going to take down the minarets, fine. But they're saying, let's not fight in the Middle East. We're not certainly not going to send any troops over there. We're just going to take down the minarets. You know, it's, it ain't, that's not the way to fight it. The enemy is pathetic. We shouldn't be turning on ourselves. We should be turning on them. You know, I, I'm from Israel, I still have all my family there, and, and um, Israel is in a horrible situation. Um, and it's not horrible because of Iran. It's not horrible because of the Palestinians. Israel is in a horrible situation because of its own intellectuals and its own people. They have lost their spine. They have lost their own self-assertiveness, the, the same as we have. Uh, Israel is just a mini America, if you will, in that respect. The difference is that America will survive. You know, even in Nuke New York, America will survive. Israel won't. One, one nuke, and Israel's done. Uh, Israel, unless it finds a moral backbone that we be talking about, unless it rejects these self-effacing ideologies, will not survive. It can't. Just look at the numbers. You run, you know, look at look at look at what's going on in the Middle East. Israel needs these ideas. It needs this philosophy more than the U.S. does. Um, and it's it's. Tragic, the direction Israel's heading is a tragic direction because it's losing that. Even the so called right wing government, you know, I used the word wimps before and I was scolded because I was too moderate. And I think that that is true of Benjamin Netanyahu. He's no, he's no tough guy, he's a woman.
in the world. Why should, a, why should a dime of America's money go to any country in the world? Anybody, anywhere. I mean, we, we've got a financial crisis in the U.S. They should be returning the money to us so that we can have a better life. Why is it going anyway? But certainly, why should it be going to the, to the enemies of the United States? But look, there is a hunger in this country for alternative ideas. There is a frustration in the status quo on foreign policy, on domestic policy, and economics, and everything. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to bring new, better, right ideas into this culture. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do, and, and I hope all of you join us in, in doing just that. Let's go fight the real battle for this country. It's out there in the streets. It's an ideological battle against our fellow Americans, and the battle is, is a battle of words. It's not a battle of arms. Go out and speak. That, that's the kind of fight we need for.